Welcome to Chapter 4, Business Processes and Functional Modeling. We are in the analysis phase of the software development lifecycle, and during this phase, we're going to be answering questions like who is going to be using the system, what the system should be doing, and where and when it will be used. So we spend some time gathering requirements by one-on-one -on -one interviews or group interviews or maybe even document analysis. And so now is the time to begin to make sense of all of those requirements that we have gathered. And we're going to do that by creating an overall view of the proposed system by looking at it from three different perspectives called architectural views. The first perspective is the functional view, where we're going to take a look at the system from the point of view of the end user. For the most part, the end user is most concerned with what the system will do. So your boss comes to you and they say, I need you to create some software that will do X, Y, Z, and W. A client walks through the door and says, I need you to create software that will do this and this and this and this. That is the functional view from the perspective of the user. And we're going to model that in Chapter 4, Business Processes and Functional Modeling. After we have a good idea of what the system should be doing from a user's perspective, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at it from the second architectural view. And that is a static view of the objects that make up the system. Imagine for just a minute that you're driving down the street and you look over into an empty lot and you see a house being built. And you can see the foundation that's poured and you can see the two by fours rising up out of the foundation. And you can see the wood on the top that is creating the, the frame for the roof of the house. What you're looking at is the bones of the house or the structure of the house. In an object-oriented environment, the bones of a software system are called the classes or the objects that are required in order to create the software. In the second architectural view or the structural view, we're going to identify the bones of the system. We're going to identify all of the classes that are necessary in order to create the software. Once we have identified all of the classes, the third architectural view is the dynamic view where we look at how the different objects in the system are communicating with one another. A software system is never static. There is always data that is being modified and manipulated and changed and updated and deleted. And that dynamic movement of data in a system is called the behavioral view. In Chapter 4, we're going to model the system from the point of view of the user, the functional view. Remember the bones of the system. And we're going to learn a variety of different tools that are available to model the system from the user's point of view. The first tool that we're going to learn about is a use case diagram, which is going to allow us to model the system and the functionality of the system at a very high level. Let's take a look of the, at the components that make up a use case diagram. Here's an example of a use case diagram that's modeling some high level functionality at a restaurant. What I can see when I look at this diagram are circles, and inside of the circles I see functionality. Ordering wine, serving food, cooking food. I also see icons that look like people, or at least they're labeled as people. I see a chef, a waiter, a client, and a cashier. And I also see lines that are connecting the people to the circles or the functionality. These are the basic formats or the basic components of a use case diagram. So let's take a closer look at the components of a use case diagram. The first one would obviously be a use case, which is a process that the system performs that benefits the actors in some way. I'm going to call them major business processes or functionality that the users can do. Speaking of users, the second component are the actors the users of the system. The actors provide input, they receive output, or maybe both from the system. The actor can be a person or a thing, like another process that is interacting with the system. If the actor is a person, the symbol is going to be an icon of a person, but if the actor is another process, it will just be a box. The next major component are the lines that are connecting all of the different components, the actors and the use cases together, and they are called relationships. We're going to find out that there are four different types of relationships. The first one is an includes relationship. This relationship is shown on the third row from the bottom. An includes relationship is a smaller part of a larger whole. For instance, placing an order 
is looking at the menu, deciding what you want, and then telling the server what you would like. Each one of those individual use cases would be included in placing an order. Another kind of a relationship is an extends. That is the second row from the bottom. An extends relationship represents optional functionality such as ordering dessert. Not everyone orders dessert, but sometimes people do. The third kind of a relationship at the very bottom row on this diagram is a generalization. You know that as an inheritance. These three types of relationships are between individual use cases. We're going to look at the fourth type of relationship. It's called an association. It is the type of relationship that an actor has with a use case where it is not a smaller part of a larger whole, it's definitely not optional, and it is not inheritance, but actors most definitely are in relationship with use cases, and so that type of a relationship is called an association. Notice that the different types of relationships have different types of lines so that you can look at the diagram and tell what kind of relationship you're looking at. So let's create a use case diagram. There are a variety of different tools that you can use to create UML diagrams. Some of them are free, some of them cost money. If you look in the instructions for homework four, there is a link to a page that shows you just several of the free tools that you can use. You can use any tools that you want to to create a use case diagram. We are gonna be using Lucidchart in this video. Lucidchart is a subscription-based website, but you can access it for free with your Weber State email credentials. If you click on the sign in with Google button, it'll allow you to key in your Weber email account credentials, which will bring you to the main homepage. From here, I can either search for the type of UM or diagram that I'm trying to create. For our purposes, we're creating a UML use case diagram, or I can select the down arrow by the plus documents and it will show me all the different diagrams that I can create. If I select UML, it is going to show me a variety of different UML. I can see a basic use case diagram example if you want to see some of the different components, or I can just click on the blank UML and create the document. Scrolling down the left hand side of the page shows me a variety of different shapes that I can use for UML diagrams. I'm going to continue scrolling until I reach UML use case and it's going to allow me to have the icons that I need to build our use case diagram. The first thing that I'm going to do is to drag and drop some use cases onto the screen. And then I'll double click on a use case or click inside of it so that I can write the name of the use case or the functionality that this particular use case represents. Let's say that we're going to order food. Um, another one is to order wine and to serve food. There were nine total use cases on our UML diagram for ordering at a restaurant, so I will add those now. So I have placed the nine use cases on the screen. The one thing that I want you to notice is the naming, the naming convention that we're using for the use cases. A use case represents functionality. That means that it has to have a verb noun phrasing for the name cook food, order wines. I don't say just order or cook or serve or eat. And I don't just say wine or food. It has to be a verb noun phrase. We are eating food or serving wine. So I used the full screen mode so that I can make my diagram larger. I'm going to click on this link so that I can bring up some more shapes because the next thing that we want to do is add the actors. So I'm going to grab the actor icon and I'm going to drag it onto the screen. For our restaurant UML diagram, there were four different actors. So I'm going to drag each one of those onto the screen. And if I double click on an actor, I can put the role or the user group that they are playing. This one is going to be the chef. So we have a chef, a cashier, a customer, and a waiter. The nice thing about Lucidchart is I can just drag this symbol around as necessary to put it close to the use cases that it is in relationship with. And the next thing that we need to do is to add those individual relationships. Um, the lines that are connecting the different components to one another. We're going to start with the association relationship. So let's look at the waiter. What relationships or what use cases should the waiter be participating in? Well, the waiter is part of ordering food, serving food, and paying for the food. So I'm going to add a line between the waiter and the use cases that they are involved in. All I have to do is hover over an object and drag a line 
between the two objects and then I'm going to format this particular line by hovering over the link at the top. We want it to be a solid line because association lines, which are the type of relationships that actors have with use cases, are always a solid line. They have no endpoints, so I'm going to make sure that the front and the back endpoints are none. And then I'm going to change the line option to be a straight line between the two objects. And I can see that I now have a relationship line between the waiter and order food. I can either create another line and format it, or I can copy and paste this line and connect it to serve food and copy it again and connect it to pay for food. If I look at another actor, such as the customer, what use cases is a customer in relationship with? And I can see that a customer can order food, they can eat the food, and they can pay for food. So I'm going to add an association line between customer and those three use cases. So the next actor is the chef. And I see that the chef is in association with ordering food. So I'm going to add an association line between the chef and ordering food. And the chef also cooks the food as well, so I add an association line to cooking food. So I can see that the line is going directly through order wine, and so I can drag the actor and place him on the diagram to try to minimize the amount of lines that are crossing. So the cashier is on the other side of the diagram from the one use case that they're in relationship with. And so it's good practice to try to put the actors near the use cases that they are most associated with. And so I'll correct this line. All right, so I see that I have some use cases that don't have any lines connected to them. There were three other types of relationships, lines that we could connect. And these are the relationships between the individual use cases. Let's take, for instance, ordering food and ordering wine. One of the types of relationship was called an extends relationship, and this is a relationship that represents optional functionality. The customer doesn't have to order any wine, but it can be an optional functionality when they are ordering their food. So I'm going to add a line that connects the ordering food use case to the ordering wine use case. Now if you notice, I already have a dashed line, but I have to decide which direction the arrow should point. So if I go back to my components, I can see that in an extends relationship, the arrow goes from the extension use case back to the base use case. And so I have my arrow that is pointing in the wrong direction. If I click on the gear icon, I can reverse the direction of the line. And now it is going from the extension use case back to the base. And then I will change the line so that it is a direct straight line. And now I can see the arrow. There's one additional thing that I want to add to this and that is the type of relationship that it is. So if I double click on the line, it allows me to add some text and in here, I'm gonna put the word extends because there is a similarity between an extends and an, an includes line. And so I wanna be as explicit as possible. I can see that there is also an extends relationship between serving wine and serving food. We're gonna see that there are two more extends relationships on this diagram between eating the food and drinking the wine, paying for the food and paying for the wine. Now I just noticed that there is one relationship missing because I have a use case called the eat food that is not associated with any actors. Now that's not necessary, but the customer should definitely be able to eat food. So I'm gonna add a association line between customer and that use case. Ah, uh, now I see that I actually added a line between customer and serving food. That is where I was missing my line from. There was another type of a relationship that we could find between individual use cases, which was called an includes relationship, the third row from the bottom. This indicates a smaller part of a larger whole. So if I look back at this use case, there is a potential for an includes relationship. Say for instance, the serving food or the serve food use case. What if I wanted to break that up into serve appetizers, serve main course. So I have added two additional use cases. And then I'm gonna add a line between serve food and these two additional new use cases. And I'm gonna make them both includes because they are a smaller part of a larger whole. We're gonna pretend for a minute that appetizers automatically come with a main course. So I'm gonna, um, the relationship line 
on an includes relationship goes from the base use case to the included use case. So we're going to go from serving food and the arrow should point to serving the appetizers. I'm going to have the line that goes straight and then I'm going to copy that line to serve main course. And then I'll make sure that I put the text on the line that indicates it's includes. I'm actually going to drag this one out a little bit just so I can see where the arrow is going. There is one additional type of relationship that we mentioned, and that was a generalization. For object-oriented programmers, you know that as inheritance. Use cases do not generally inherit from another use case. They extend or include but actors can inherit from other actors. Let's pretend just for a moment that we had a head chef and then we had the sous chefs or the assistant chefs that are working for them. I'm going to add another chef and then the type of relationship that we're going to have, I will change this one to be the head chef and I will change the one below it to be a, an assistant chef. And then I'll in, add a type of inheritance line between the assistant and the head chef. Inheritance lines always go from the child to the parent. So I'm going to change the type of endpoint to a solid line. And then I'll move the two symbols around a little bit so that the uh, relationship between the two of them is more apparent. So now here is an example of a UML diagram that contains all of the use cases it contains the actors and the relationships between the components on the screen. There is one additional component that we need to add. If we come back to our components, you're going to notice that the third row down is called the subject boundary. This is a box that I'm going to draw around the items that are a part of the system so that I can see what belongs to the software system and what is outside of the software system interacting with it. It's called a boundary. So we're going to go back to the shapes in Lucid Charts. I'm going to find my UML use cases, and in Lucid Charts, they call it a container. So I'm going to drag a container onto the screen, and I'm going to resize it so that the container inside of the container are all of the use cases, and on the outside of the container are all of the actors. Actors are not a part of the system. Actors interact with it. The use cases, on the other hand, are inside of the system. I can click on the name of the container and change the name so that I can know what use case diagram I am on. So I'm going to change the name from boundary to restaurant processes. And so now I have a overview, a UML diagram that is showing the functionality of the restaurant processes from the perspective of the end user. Now, on the back end, I know the head chef is doing a lot more things and the waiter is doing a lot more things, but from the perspective of the user, these are the major business processes, the major functionalities that are taking place. And this is an example of a use case diagram